Welcome to News Talk with Simone Vani at the International News Channel. Hindus all around the world were outraged over the dismantling global Hindutva conference that was held in September this year. The three-day conference was said to be invested in examining the Hindutva ideology that propagates hate, promotes Islamophobia, and seeks to reduce the myriad practices of Hinduism to a singular notion of a Hindu motherland, according to the organizers. Now, to add salt to the injury, Toronto Public Library has teamed up with Ryerson University to hold a similar event called Modi's India, how Hindu nationalism has eroded the world's largest democracy. This has sparked a whole new wave of outrage amongst Hindus in Canada and Hindus worldwide. Canadian Hindus have come together to oppose the event from taking place and have come up with their own set of demands. Joining me today to discuss the conference and their stance on it is Dr. Jay Bansal, Rashmi Sinha, Utsav Chakrabarti, and Rakesh Bansal. Dr. Jay Bansal is a retired chief scientific officer from a global petrochemical corporation. He is currently serving as the Vice President of Education of the World Hindu Council of America. Rashmi Sinha is a Senior Environmental Consultant, a member of the VP Program for the Council of India, Societies of Edmonton. She is Acting President of the Shanti Niketan Society, President of the Voice of Hindus, and an active volunteer at Hindupath. Rakesh Bansal is an engineer by profession and a volunteer with Hindu organizations in the Edmonton area. Utsav Chakrabarti is the Executive Director of Hindupath. An architect by profession, Utsav has been presenting the case of Hindu and other subaltern communities to thought leaders in Washington, D.C. for more than 18 years. An astute observer of geopolitical trends inside the Washington Beltway, his works have been presented to the lawmakers at the Capitol Hill and to representatives of the Human Rights Commission at the United Nations. I want to welcome you all to the show and thank you for agreeing to speak to me. So welcome to the show, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Just a quick disclaimer, though, I'm going to tailor this in a way where I'm asking a question aimed at one of you. But for all of you, please feel free to jump in at any time with your thoughts, all right? So my first question is for all of you, though. I just want to know your initial reactions when you found out about this conference that is taking place on Canadian soil. That also with the time proximity so close to the conference in September in the USA. So how, what were your initial feelings about it? I guess, uh, you know, I have to say that, you know, I was outraged and appalled that an academic institution and a public library would engage in a hate mongering campaign mm. uh, against a peace loving and a highly contributed community uh, like the Hindu Canadians. Mm -hmm. Simone, uh, your viewers have to understand that, you know, we're not concerned about, uh, you know, Indi Indian democracy or Mr. Modi. They are far bigger than uh, and far stronger than uh, these institutions, and they know how to take care of themselves. Mm. We are really concerned about the Hindu Canadian community. In events like this, they basically create uh, you know uh, an atmosphere of dislike and uh, hate against them, which in turn uh, you know uh, poses a threat to their well-being. Mm. So we particularly worry about our you know next generation who might be bullied. Uh, you know, in the school. Yeah, no, fair enough. How about the rest of you guys? So I just wanted to say that <clears throat> this is something that it's deeply concerning for us because uh, this is not the first time this is happening and this is becoming a trend. So yeah. what what many of us are feeling is that uh, th this is causing uh, some sort of a directed propaganda against the Hindu community in Canada. Uh, which, as JG pointed out, is going to impact the future generations of Canadian Hindus and can people in Canada in general. And that is something that we do not like and we are really concerned about. Mm -hmm. No, that's fair enough. So basically, uh, you know, JG has said something about Indian democracy and Mr. Modi. But I would like to point out as well that is there a neighboring country with, which we can even compare to? I mean, we're talking about the largest democracy, and what else do we need to say? Yeah. Thank you. I agree with all the speakers' point of view, and just I want to add that, yes, uh, I haven't seen, I have been living in Canada for the last 25 years, and lately I'm seeing these kind of events taking place, which is creating kind of, you know, a, a big drift in our society between uh, among our communities, different community, faith of a group of people. 
which is uh, very, very alarming and concerning yeah. for, especially for our next generation. We understand, we understand Hinduism, we understand Hindu dharma, but our next generation, they have, they do not understand that much. And if they are brainwashed like this with all fake narratives, yeah. uh, this is a very, very uh, concerning situation uh, in coming years in the Canadian soil yeah. and in North America. Yeah, no, that's absolutely correct. And going off of what Rashmiji just said, Utsavji, what is the Hindu community's position on this conference? Are they concerned? Are they upset? Are they angry? Are they scared? What reactions have you been seeing from people? So we are deeply concerned, scared, and angry, to put it succinctly. Uh, mm. Angry because this is an attempt by two publicly funded institutions in Canada mm -hmm. to allow their platform to be used to spread false propaganda and concocted narratives about the democracy in India, uh, a country which has uh, a vast majority of Hindu Canadian uh, Hindu Canadians following uh, as their heritage. Mm. We are also concerned because this is nothing short of an attempt to promote a hateful and denigrative narrative against the Hindu community, which, as I pointed out before, uh, you know, is usually being uh, sent out and brought out in the point in in the guise of sanctimonious pontifications on quote unquote Indian democracy. So, and the third thing that I wanted to mention is we are scared because mm. this is exactly the kind of steady propaganda that creates the othering of the Hindus mm. in North America. And when I say othering, we already have a history where Hindu Americans, Hindus in America, as well as in Canada, have faced targeted violence, have their temples have been targeted and desecrated on occasion, mm. and they have faced discrimination in the public square. So... This othering only adds to that threat, and therefore we are scared as well. Yeah, that's absolutely correct. For Rashmiji, would you be able to tell our viewers about the organizations that are representing the Hindus of Canada when it comes to opposing this event? Absolutely. So there are so many Hindu organizations who are really outraged by uh, after listening to this and have started uh, opposing this in their own manner. And we are from Hindu Pact, uh, Voice of Hindus. Um, uh, VHPA and Coalition of uh, Hindus of North America, which is known as KONA. Uh, and I'm sure like um, I saw a tweet from uh, Hindu Forum of Canada. So we all are raising anonymous voice against this event. I hear that you guys are demanding something from these organizations as well. Would you be able to tell us about the demands? Sure. So first of all, we have three very precise demands. Mm -hmm. um, the first one is to cancel this event immediately. This should not happen. Mm -hmm. As uh, we already mentioned in our, you know, uh, why we oppose this. So we demand to cancel this event. And second, um, University of Horizon and Toronto Public Library should send an, uh, you know, apology. Uh, they should apologize to our Hindu community for, you know, uh, for causing this uh, blatantly Hindu phobic events like, you know, and uh, anguish among our group, our community. And third, the university and the library, they should set a program to train their employees uh, to understand Hindu dharma and Hindu religion and India uh, so that they are a little bit more sensitive uh, when it comes to make any such, such kind of decision to host this kind of event. So they are more aware of the facts, what they are, you know, uh, inviting to. Mm -hmm. So those three are we are demanding to mm -hmm. to them. No, that sounds fair enough to be completely fair. JG, for you, these organizations that Rashmiji just mentioned, so what is their primary objection to the event? Or, well, in your opinion, what exactly is wrong with the subject of the event? Well, Sumani, how much time do you have? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Take your time. <laughs> because fact of the matter is uh, that the entire premise of this event is uh, is wrong. Mm. You know, I will just list a few things, you know, just uh, as headlines, and then we're more than happy to back them up with actual data and evidence, you know, in, in further discussion. Mm -hmm. But I think for your viewers, I'll just list a few things that come to mind. Yeah, please. So, uh, first of all, contrary to the title of the event, Indian democracy is actually a vibrant democracy, the largest democracy in the world. It's vibrant. It is functioning exactly as a democracy should. Mm -hmm. The will of the people is reflected in the policies and programs of the nation. Right. Secondly, uh, 
contrary to what this event and some vested interest in the world, uh, Western world would have us believe, Modi is a visionary leader with very high level of integrity and enjoys reputation as a world statesman of high caliber. Third, uh, treatment of minorities in India should be held as an example for the world and not be used as a stick to beat India and Hindus with. Mm -hmm. Fourth, this is even more true when one considers the treatment of minorities in neighboring countries like China, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and Afghanistan. Five, frankly, the West lacks any kind of moral authority to throw stones at their societies. Their own history of treatment of minorities is so appalling that sh they should be ashamed of themselves. And that includes Canada, by the way. Mm -hmm. And even more closer to home, many of the universities in Canada are morally incompetent to talk about the treatment of minorities. The reality is that these so-called bastions of scholarship have such despicable history of bigotry uh, that a cesspool would look cleaner in their comparison. Number seven, Ryerson University itself has a pathetic history of racism, which they're trying to paper over by changing their name. Mm -hmm. That's right. But Institutions living off of taxpayer money, fair and even handed, and not promote hatred against certain segments of the society. So I'll stop there. But, you know, behind each of these points, uh, there is a lot of data and information that we're willing to share with the viewers. JJ, these are some very important points that you have brought up, and they definitely need to be addressed as a whole. I actually want to open the floor to the rest of my guests and see what your thoughts are on this. or mention anything that JG might, might have missed? Well, I would like to add that the, the religious uh, minorities in the surrounding regions are something that uh, need to be focused on, uh, especially in countries, as JG pointed out, Afghanistan, Bangladesh, uh, and Pakistan, mm -hmm. you know, the region in which India lives, and not to mention China. So just to, just to look at Afghanistan, for example, the last Hindu and Sikh minorities from Afghanistan just fled in the last one year and now the country is doesn't have any minorities these people especially the hindus of afghanistan go back more than 3000 years the recorded history of afghanistan mm. is full of hindu history so just just north of india you have a country where after 3000 years of existence and civilizational growth there are no more hindus and sikhs left mm. let's go down to pakistan in 1947 actually in 1952, when they had the, the census done after partition, the minority population in Pakistan was close to 12%. Right now, it's 2%. So the, one sixth of its minority has vanished in the last 70 years. And let's go to Bangladesh. In Bangladesh, you know, the Hindu minority used to be 22% of the population back in, in when it was part of Pakistan uh, in, in 19, uh, 1947. Again, based on 1952 and 54 uh, data. Now, you only have 8.5% minorities in Bangladesh based on 2011 data. Mm. So you look around the Indian subcontinent and you see how religious minorities have faced real persecution. Compare that to India. In India, the religious minorities have doubled in the last 70 years. Mm. So you can see the irony and the false propaganda that is being projected out using taxpayers' money from these institutions in Canada, the Ryerson University, the Toronto Public Library. Mm. Th there cannot be a worse irony that they target India for its democracy and for its quote-unquote treatment of minorities mm. when right around India, the minorities are being decimated. Mm. So that's something we, we wanted uh, people to know. That's something we want people to understand. And that will help people see through the the falsehoods and, and the and the straw man narratives that these events are propagating. Uh, one more thing I want to bring to the notice of the audience is that we know that many of these people don't care what we say because they have you know when you have a f straw man narrative this false, you really do not care about what other people think about you. But it is important for the audience to understand 
the nature of this falsehood and that is where we are why we are having this conversation no absolutely you're right and numbers don't lie as they say right so numbers yeah, don't lie numbers absolutely are staggering the difference is staggering too yeah actually if i may add something to uh, what usuf ji had just said yeah. uh, there was actually a report that uh, was published by pew research center it's a uh, you know uh, an independent think tank the report came out in june of this year 2021 and i'll just read three or four uh, you know statements from that report to kind of uh, you know uh, buttress the uh, the points that uh, utsav ji just made about the treatment of minorities in india okay. first it says indians of all religious backgrounds overwhelmingly say that they are very free to practice their faiths that's one number two indians see religious tolerance as a central part of who they are as a nation this is pure research center saying number 3 across the major religious groups most people say that it is very important to respect all religions to be a truly indian finally indians are united in the view that respecting other religions is very important part of what it means to be a member of their own religion and their own religious community so when you look at these independent report by a very respected you know american think tank uh and juxtapose that with the kind of narrative that uh, this particular event is trying to project it just makes absolutely no sense whatsoever so i'll i'll give the floor to others to speak on some of the other points uh, perhaps yeah rakesh ji how about you what are you thinking oh i i can actually add anything more than what jay ji has um, said and of course what sir ji gave a lot of uh, you know detailed information in terms of percentages as well mm -hmm. so basically these people if they ever been to india i'm not sure if they've actually been talking to the real people but what we do know is our records say that every minority in india feels very 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 safe and what these people are uh, you know projecting here is absolutely baseless i would love to see their records where they get their source uh, like where they get their data from mm. is it just is it just somebody's thinking or is is there something that they can back up that's all i would like to say i would just like to add something uh, to the conversation that we are having to make people understand why and who are the people behind this event mm -hmm. uh, what i wanted to point out in this is that the people who are organizing this event the two speakers there christopher chefferlor as well as uh, uh, mr ruparelia both were associated before with a hindu phobic event that was uh, called the dismantle hindutva conference that held mm -hmm. all over north america mm -hmm. it was heavily discredited interestingly uh, mr ruparelia has worked in the past in with columbia university with a gentleman named manan ahmed who was also part of the dismantle hindutva conference Manan Ahmed maintains a close working relationship with the uh, the national security advisor of Pakistan Mohit Yusuf so it is i just want to throw this out there in front of the people to understand and connect the dots if they feel the need to so the national security advisor of Pakistan to prime minister Imran Khan working closely with one of the co-hosts of this event and they can connect the rest of the dots um i just want to add what uh, like you have you all have mentioned uh, beautifully about like you know uh, the reason and uh, what is happening i just want to uh, talk little bit about our on uh, what's happening in our land in on canadian soil mm -hmm. and has anybody even thought about it or talked about it um uh, recently we heard about that um Uh, residential school mm -hmm. uh, the racism in canadian institution uh, it runs deep uh, here and uh, we the most canadian universities don't want to hold people accountable for that whether that be the founders the uh, staff members or students that have contributed to the history of racism and enslavement instead canadian universities prefer to push it aside and pretend that nothing has happened here and on the contrary um they are promoting events like this without like uh, i agree with rakesh ji if they really have any idea 
the ground level experience what's happened there, happening there and just uh, i was in india last month for a month and i saw such a positive change i was so happy to see what's happening the growth india is doing financially infrastructure you can talk i was actually very very impressed and i really thank to the uh, current government for doing such a wonderful job so if you look at the ground level and what is being portrayed here it doesn't match at all mm. so you know just wanted to add that aspect yeah no absolutely it's it's a lot of words being thrown around everywhere um i just want to um, you know add something to this conversation you know it's become a fashionable lately in the western world to uh, to decry india's democracy in general and the current prime minister in particular mm. but i think it's worthwhile to pierce that that bubble quite honestly mm. and uh, let me just share some statistics i mean statistics are numbers tell the whole story and be your your viewers can make their own judgments from the, those numbers i think first of all it's not even worth contesting that india is world's largest democracy you know there are 912 million registered voters in india that is 30 times the population of canada just the number of registered voters okay um in the most recent general election that took place in 2019 the voter turnout was 67% it's a highly participative democracy uh in the western world there is there is no parallel to it. there's no example that matches that kind of turnout number 3 the ruling party received 37% of the popular vote which is the highest vote share of any political party since 1989 in india the uh, the ruling party the bjp received 303 seats out of a total of 545 seats in the lower house called lok sabha mm-hmm. now accounting for the coalition support the ruling party actually accounts for 345 seats which is 63% of the lower house seats altogether Now since that general election the BJP has won some elections at the state level or the provincial uh, provincial level and has also lost some some pretty cr- critical elections I mean that should tell your viewers that you know uh, the elections are free and fair in India mm-hmm. you know if if they were contrived elections there would be no reason why a powerful party like BJP would lose critical elections uh the other point i would make is modi also won his own seat by 60% 64% vote share his biggest opponent received only 18% and finally majority of the world looks at mr modi as a truly visionary leader okay by some accounts his popularity around the globe stands at 80% that is far above that of other world leaders which includes vladimir putin putin uh Angela Merkel and Boris Johnson mm-hmm. and I want to talk about our own prime minister of Canada where what his standing in the world is I don't think I want to embarrass my Canadian friends by talking about him so um you know finally I think we should also note the fact that India is operating in a neighborhood that's infested with totalitarian regimes mm-hmm. many of which are supported by brutal theocratic states you know with china which is an unmitigated oppressive regime on its northern border and a complete lack of functioning democracies from india's western border all the way to the mediterranean sea not a single functioning democracy in that whole geography you know given all that except except israel except israel yeah. you know i would i would argue you know to any fair minded person that india's democracy should be looked upon as a beacon of hope for the uh, for the world and not be criticized for some imagined transgressions so i think that i'll 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 park it there no no that's absolutely correct and i love the points that all of you have made 
But coming back to the conference itself, Rakesh ji, I understand that you yourself reached out to the parties that are involved. So how did that pan out for you? So that's true that most of us or a group of us have reached out to these uh, parties, be it uh, a university or the public library mm -hmm. through various forms, like phone calls, emails. Yet they have totally ignored our gesture of a friendly and a professional discussion. I am still waiting for some kind of response, um, you know, in an email or a phone call back, but none to date has come. So I'm not hopeful because this event is now in two days from now. I think they've heard from us, but what, what are they doing? I have no idea. So I will still wait and be positive and, you know, some more pressure is being put on from all sorts of, uh, you know, institutions and organizations. And I hope they do listen to us in some form or another. No, that's fair. So Rakesh Ji and JJ for that matter, why do you think that these institutions are engaging in this kind of showcased hate towards the Hindu Canadian community? So, well, Simone, uh, again, uh, how much time do you have? <laughs> my, <I'll take> yours. <laughs> my pet phrase. Um, I think there are a number of reasons for this. You know, firstly, there was a time when the Western world had managed to colonize, uh, you know, the rest of the world. Uh, since they were the rulers, you know, they developed some, they developed some really bad social habits. You know, they got into the habit of lecturing the colonized societies, you know, as to what was wrong with them and how they should be conducting their business. You know, unfortunately for them, the you know, the colonization period is over, but they just are having a hard time adjusting to the new realities. You know, the fact is that with passage of time, their sanctimonious lecturing is falling on deaf ears. No one really gives a damn about them anymore. Uh, you know, they're like dogs that can't hunt anymore, but they like to enjoy a bark once in a while. Um, secondly, you know, again, concocted with the colonial mindset, the this Europeans came up with this race theory, which put the white race on top of, top of the heap. You know, with no rhyme or reason or evidence, they began to feel superior to everyone else. You know, um, now if you, you know, if you think you're superior to everyone else, what are you going to do? Except, you know, feel that it's your moral duty to lecture others, tell them what to do, how they should do it. This is a mental affliction that uh, takes many generations to work itself out. And they just haven't gotten over it yet. Finally, Hindus are a peaceful community. They do not make the culprits pay for their misdeeds. You know, if there was a Charlie Hebdo kind of uh, uh, incident coming out of the community today, I bet these guys will be scamping like rats that they are. But since we are a peaceful community, that's not going to happen. And they just feel uh, like there's no consequence for their actions. So, Utsaji, what do you think about the principle of academic freedom? So is it not important that our academic institutions remain free of societal pressures in pursuit of the truth? Well, I, I think freedom is important, mm -hmm. and it, but freedom has to be within the limits because no society can be absolutely free if it harms somebody else. Mm. So that's the first point I want to make. Mm -hmm. Secondly, the key phrase in your question is in pursuit of truth which is nowhere to be seen in this conversation. Uh, mm. As we discussed, as JG, myself, and everybody else pointed out, uh, there is no truth that these people are pointing towards. Thirdly, it is intellectually dishonest to have public money. You know, these institutions are publicly funded. Mm -hmm. So to have public funding uh, uh, as the source of supporting falsehood it's not, it's not uh, at all academic freedom because you know public money can be used for better, especially when many of these this monies are coming from Hindus who are in Canada. So essentially, they're using Hindu taxpayers' money to target Hindus, and that is that is really really wrong. And fourthly, 
uh, you know, academic institutions have this habit of using this trope, trope of academic freedom a lot. Uh, but many a times they do it very conveniently for certain ideological uh, beneficiaries. Just to give you an example, uh, a few weeks ago, a Nobel laureate and a victim of the Islamic State, a person named Nadia Murad, she spent two years as a slave of the Islamic State and was given a Nobel Prize by uh, the, the, the International Nobel Committee, Nobel Peace Prize. And she was deplatformed in Canada because her event was supposed to be promoting Islamophobia. So this, this uh, you know, academic freedom uh, is a trope that uh, many of these institutions use, but they do, do it very selectively, and that's why it is just a trope. So Rakesh Ji, for you, what is the recourse if they carry on with the event? So <clears throat> before I answer that, in spite of our you know, terrible racist history that we've had, and of course, uh, you know, Canadian society does have a reputation, though, today, to engage ourselves in a very polite manner for, you know, sociopol uh, sociopolitical discourse. Mm -hmm. But if they don't cancel this event, if they don't apologize to Hindu, Hindu Canadians in, you know, in Toronto area or elsewhere in the rest of the country, what we can do is we can certainly have, you know, multiple avenues available to us. And if they do choose to go ahead with it, those avenues we will be certainly, you know, won't hesitate to use them to our, uh, to push our narrative forward, which is we would like them to cancel this event as early as possible. That would be our first demand. Fair enough. And Rashmiji, for you, what kind of consequences do you see this event holding if it does go through as planned? That's mm -hmm. a wonderful question uh, because when, uh, since they are doing this, they must have some purpose. So uh, looking at, you know, recent um, social media, you can see there are so many racist comments uh, uh, everywhere on whether it's Facebook or Twitter and even in schools and universities. So this will, you know, enhance in those kind of happening, uh, those events, the um, event lectures like this will promote those kind of bullying and uh, you know racism in our university and in school which is actually not at all acceptable because the schools and universities people go to uh, learn you know um, uh, bhaichara or brotherhood and uh, increase the harmony and peace on the other hand on the contrary by this kind of events it will promote the reverse you know and that is, we are witnessing this. To give an example, like um, uh, in uh, Edmonton, uh, when this Tiranga Yatra happened to, you know, uh, celebrate festival of Holi and um, to increase the Indo-Canadian relationship, we witnessed uh, derogatory comments and even like fights and bullying and that kind of scary, you know. Uh, and if, if this is increasing, what kind of societies are we forming? And that is a very big question. Our leaders, our institution, they must consider, you know, and uh, why do they even allow happening these kind of things? And uh, that's what I want to say. And to viewers, be very, very careful. Uh, when you hear those kind of things, do the fact checks and, you know, just don't follow blindly. <laughs> that's what I want to say. So from every single one of you, are there any final comments you want to tell our viewers? Yeah, so uh, I, actually, I just want to thank uh, uh, Tag TV uh, for uh, you know this opportunity to get our voice out there, and I just want to address the Hindu community, uh, you know, Hindu uh, Canadian community at large. You know, these these events are uh, coming fast and furious. The you know there is a pattern here, and I think they just need to uh, you know wake up and understand that uh, you know this is this is not without consequences for them and for their children and, uh, you know, children thereafter. Uh, they simply need to band together and, uh, you know, and make every effort to put, put an end to this nonsense. Um, I think there is, uh, you know, Sangei uh, Shakti Kali Yuge. You know, uh, coll collective strength is bigger than individual strength. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so that's that would be my... You know, if I could say words of advice, but, uh, you know, uh, just work, work request to the Hindu community at large. Thank you. 
I would I would like to add uh, along with what JG said that uh, firstly we uh, I would like to thank profusely Tag TV for being the voice of the community mm -hmm. and actually showing uh, that there is democracy in terms of outreach in the media. Uh, so thank you so much to Tag TV. Additionally, I would like to say that Hindu Pact in Canada, along with every other organization that has joined hand to protest this, uh, will be working further on this. So, so just like the uh, the people who are organizing who are organizing anti-Hindu conferences uh, have an agenda and they are going to continue to target Hindus, we will unite, and uh, they should understand that this is this is going to give us strength in our numbers, and we will work towards ensuring that people know the truth. That's what I would like to say. Rakesh ji, Ashmi ji, any final words? <laughs> Jai ji and Usab ji has said it so beautifully. I, I, I don't think I could even add a single word, but thank you to TAC TV. That's all I would like to say. So my final word, thank you TAC TV for giving us this opportunity. And I, I echo um, Usab ji. Uh, this is a true representation of democracy, you know, where we can also speak our mind and our voice. And again, yes, to the viewers, um, uh, we are, uh, you know, we do tolerate, but now we will not tolerate for anything which are injustice or, um, you know, attacking uh, acts on Hindu dharma. We, we will stand up together and we will fight for the right cause. But if we are uh, like, you know, so just we are awakening. Thank you. That's great. And I want to thank you all for joining me. And I want to wish you all the best for the future. Thank you. Thank you, Nas. Thank you. Thank you, Simone. Um, Namaskar. Namaskar. And thank you to our viewers for joining us. You're watching the International News Channel on Tag TV. I am Simone Ivani. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and turn on the bell notifications to stay up to date on all of our latest content.